Welcome to Accelerate Church's television broadcast. My name is Garrett Griffin, and this is my wife, Farrell. We're associate ministers here at Accelerate Church. And we're thrilled you're joining us. We invite you to get your expectations up, get your hopes up, and get ready for God's Word that will come forth from Pastor Jeremy. It's going to be a great message. Get your Bible out, and let's jump in. When you pray in the Holy Spirit, it makes you sensitive to hear His voice. Well, I believe I'm sensitive to hear His voice, and He wants me to talk to you today about the dangers of apathy. The dangers of apathy. Go to Luke chapter 12 and say, thank God for the Word. Luke chapter 12. <laughs> yeah, I love y'all. I'll tell you, some of the best Christians I've ever met, most giving, best-hearted people I've ever met, go right here to Accelerate Church. If I'm talking to you. I would have you give yourself a hand clap, but turn to the Bible. we got to move here. Luke chapter 12. <laughs> Besides, that might feel weird giving yourself a hand clap, wouldn't it? You want to try it? Nah, okay. Luke 12. Okay, there you go. Praise God. Some of you ain't scared to do it. Luke chapter 12, verse 15. Jesus said to them, it gets serious pretty quick when Jesus speaks. Take heed. Another way of saying, pay attention and beware of covetousness. You need to be aware of this. Many people in this world have weaved a web of covetousness and don't realize they're caught in their own web. They go to work, and what drives them to go to work is covetousness. They don't have enough. They want more. But see, what I talked to you about in Psalm 23 is connected to this. When you realize He is your shepherd, you don't have to make it work. You trust Him and do what He says, and He brings the blessing. In fact, here's the way the Bible talks about it. The blessing will overtake you. See, you don't pursue the blessing, you pursue God. A good way to know, a good test to take of whether or not you're a covetous person or not is are you pursuing God or are you pursuing things? Jesus, your master, said, pay attention, be aware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. May I point out something? If your life doesn't consist in the abundance of things, it also doesn't consist in the lack of things. Life is about a lot more than the things you have. God doesn't mind you having things to enjoy. In fact, one scripture says he's given you things to enjoy. You're his child. He wants you to enjoy. But let me tell you, life's a lot bigger than just things that we have. Homes that we have. Vehicles we have, right? Clothes that we have. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Appliances we have there in the kitchen, ladies. You know, those are cool, some of the appliances they have and what they do now. But, you know, I say this in partnership. If you don't plug them in, they just take up space. And that's kind of how Christians are. They don't ever want to plug in totally to the Lord Jesus Christ, to the Holy Spirit, and to a local church. And so therefore, something creeps up on them that they don't hear about very often. It's called apathy. Apathy. It's one of the greatest dangers to an American Christian. Now Jesus said, your life does not consist in the abundance of the things you possess. Praise God. He then immediately started telling a story, a parable. And he spoke to them in Luke 12, verse 16. If you're listening by radio, get your, get your Bible out right now. You need to see this. He said, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And, verse 17 says, he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, instead of giving it away, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And verse 19, I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease. That jumped off the page at me. You see, I'm committed this year to going through the New Testament once a month. I was listening to my audio Bible. I have it divided into two different playlists, a Gospels playlist, which is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I went ahead and threw Acts in there. And then all of the rest of them, the epistles from the book of Romans all the way to Revelation in another playlist. And so I switched day by day, and I'm going through the entire New Testament. I came across this, and I'm telling you, it just jumped off on the inside of me. I went and got my Bible and looked it up. He said, take your ease. This man is saying that to himself. Just take it easy. Now look at what he says immediately after that. Eat, drink, and be merry. I would dare point out that that is a description of taking it easy. I'm just going to eat. I'm going to drink. I'm just going to party. Just be merry. Be happy. Just smile. 
Whatever it is that makes me happy, that's what I'm going to do. Is that sin? No, but you should not take ease all the time. Jesus is telling us a story. Look at what God said to this man that said, take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. God said, fool. Whoa. Now, I know this is serious because Jesus pointed out in another scripture that we're not to call somebody a fool. I remember as a teenager, uh, one of my buddies was talking to another guy. He said, hey, fool. And I said, man, don't talk like that. He's like, what's your problem? I'll call you a fool. I said, you can say what you want to say, but Jesus said not to call anybody a fool. You endanger yourself a hellfire. And here God the Father called somebody a fool? Whoa. Let me back up and let's see what this guy said that got God to talk like that to him. He said, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God says, that's a fool. This night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you've provided? In other words, when it's time to give an account for your life, somebody else has to deal with all your stuff. This man was completely consumed with his stuff. He said, I'm going to tear down my barns, going to build new ones. I'm going to take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. God said, you're a fool. That's pretty stout, isn't it? Some people don't even know that's in the Bible. You ought to check and make sure this preacher's reading to you something from the Bible. I don't have a trick Bible up here on the screen. I do have New King James, but King James says the same. Fool. Wow. Aren't you glad I didn't name this series Fool? People would stay away by the droves. But instead, I named it the danger of apathy because all fools have this sin in their life. Apathy. It's not your soul will be required. All your stuff, who's going to take care of it? Then he said this, verse 21 of Luke 12. So is he who lays up treasure for himself, but is not rich toward God. Many people in the day you and I live are living to be rich But sadly, it's usually for themselves. We should be aiming and living our lives. I just talked about it in December, making it count, if you remember. We're doing this. We're aiming to be rich toward God. Wake up! Hi, my name is Erin File, and I'm the pastor's wife here at Accelerate Church, where we are telling people, Wake up! If you have been lulled to sleep in this crazy life, it's time to wake up to who you are called to be. God has called you. And you might say, Erin, well, well, my life is, is pretty pitiful. It, it doesn't match the church. Well, you know what? Who cares about the past? It's time to change that. Today is your day to change it. Today is a new day. God's given you a new day. His mercies are new every morning. And His mercies are towards you today to say, come. Come to the house of the Lord. Come to Accelerate Church. Come. The Holy Spirit's drawing you. He's calling you. I believe that's why you're watching even now. Because the Holy Spirit is saying, I know you by name. And come. Come to God. Come to His family. And learn to live in freedom. Learn to live in peace and learn to live in joy. We want you here at Accelerate Church. You have accounts in heaven. Paul told the church at Philippi, he said, I don't seek your money, though you're the only church that gave to me. But I'm believing for fruit to abound to your account. Referring to a heavenly account. Jesus is referring to that same heavenly account right here when he says the person who doesn't care about their account in heaven but is all about laying up treasures right here is a fool. Wow. That's, whew. I tell you, when I read the Bible, to me it's hard hitting. I don't just read my Bible for a gold star because I'm pastor and that's what I'm supposed to do. I think, wow, Lord, thank you for speaking to me. See, first I took this for myself. But then I have this urgency. You've got to preach this to this remnant church called Accelerate Church because people need to know this. You can't be living for yourself. You've got to live to be rich toward God. Wow. I want to remind you again that to take ease here 
is described as eating, drinking, and being merry. That made me think of some other scriptures in the Bible because this isn't the only place in the Bible where you see this about eating, drinking, and just being happy. So where else did, do you find it? Well, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Aren't you thankful for the word today? He says here in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 10, Paul writing, my inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Moreover, brethren, now time out. Anytime you see brethren or beloved in the New Testament, you'd be good to go ahead and write your name down there and personalize it for you. That's properly dividing the Word of God. So this scripture and what we're about to read, these next few scriptures, are written directly to you. Say this, I receive it. I receive it. The Lord's watching. Tell him, I receive it. He says, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud. This was no iCloud. This was a cloud God provided by day in the desert to keep them cool. And a cloud of fire by night to keep them warm. On a day like this, they were probably thanking God for that fire. Amen. They were under the cloud. They all passed through the sea. You remember that story? Facing the Red Sea, no way out. Here comes the Egyptian army. Good thing they were playing follow the leader that day and weren't mad at Moses. They would have died. But thank God, God gave Moses the answer, parted the Red Sea. And you can find out that from the foundation of the earth, when the earth was created, God made a highway right through that Red Sea. It's there today if you were to go down there and look. Had the ability to go look. God made a way, a path that was dry. Split, they went. Now, I want you to think of this. There was at least two million people. I was thinking about this. I heard somebody talking about this on Kingdom Keys a few weeks ago. But just imagine if they were 50 deep wide, how long that would take more than 2 million people to walk through there. Some people say they were a lot deeper than that. They were wide, like 50. Some say 2,000. I think it's just up to whatever. Sometimes I think it's like they're picking lottery numbers, some of these scholars. There's 2,000. There's 50. I'm like, well, they all have their opinions. It doesn't matter. All I know is it's miraculous. And, And here... We have Paul writing to a church after the cross, after the resurrection, after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, where we're set up. And he's telling them about what happened. They had a cloud to protect them. They passed through the Red Sea. And they were dancing that day, praising God for the mighty warrior that he is. He'll get you out of a jam. He destroyed the greatest army known to man. Wow. They all were baptized 1 Corinthians 10, 2 says, into Moses, in the cloud, and in the sea. See, a type of baptism. Verse 3, they all ate the same spiritual food. Verse 4, they all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock, capital R, that followed them. That rock was Christ. The same rock you're to be building your life on, so that when the winds blow, when the storm rises, your life stands. But it won't if you're not basing your life on the Word of God. You can't base your life on the opinion of man. You've got to make your decision today. Choose who you're going to serve. As for me and my house, we're serving God, not people. Verse 5, 1 Corinthians 10. This is a startling verse. All those miraculous things, and there's many other things we could talk about, but Paul, by the Holy Spirit, says, but with most of those people, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Wow. What a legacy. You know, we got this guy coming next week, Dr. Mark Henry. You've seen us talk about it in announcements about planned giving, end of life giving, one more way to stick it to the devil. We all need to get our lives in order when it comes to this. We really do. And he's going to be here after church. He's, not going, to be, he's going to be having a meeting. He might sit in service. I don't know. But I know this. He's going to be meeting us after church, 1215. You ought to be there. If you haven't signed up, you need to sign up for it because we're serving refreshments. But... You want to leave a lasting legacy. You don't want it to be written about you. Well, they lived and then they just died in Amarillo. You go out to the graveyard, it shows the year you're born, shows the dash and the year you died. There's a lot of things included in that dash. What are people going to remember you for? Your life is to be a Bible, a walking, talking epistle that people read and points people to Christ. That's what I pray my life is. But God was not pleased with these covenant people. These were people that God delivered with an outstretched arm, a mighty right hand. Praise God. Miraculously split the Red Sea, drowned Pharaoh and his army, provided food for them, provided water when they were thirsty. Are you listening to me? All these miracles. Their sandals weren't even getting worn out. They had true prosperity happening. 
I mean, that's miraculous. Back in the day, you can't tell me the technology was as cool back then as it is now. They had sandals. The straps wouldn't even wear out. Walking out in the desert, sand blowing everywhere, out in the heat, didn't wear out. It's amazing to me. But with most of them, God was not well pleased because their bodies were scattered in the wilderness, telling us God wants us to have a greater legacy than that. Now, these things happen, and they became our examples. Isn't that something? In other words, we shouldn't just shake our head and go, well, that's terrible. Terrible that happened to them. That's not the point. The point is they're examples for you to the intent that you shouldn't lust after evil things as they did. That means they desired all these evil things. And verse 7, do not become idolaters as some of them were. As it's written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Oh, I think we just read that in Luke 12, didn't we? Well, the guy in Luke 12 wasn't the first one to ever have that idea. Children of Israel, they sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. It says in verse 8, 1 Corinthians 10, nor let us commit sexual immorality. Boy, America needs to hear this message. Don't commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. They died. 23,000 people died in one day. Nor complain. Oh, I'm wanting to get to that one. Verse 9, don't tempt Christ. As some of them tempted and were destroyed by servants. Don't complain. The reason I wanted to get to this one, this one's so relevant for every church in the United States of America. You see, it could be four degrees outside. We got 70.6 degrees inside. People say, it's too cold. Others are like, man, we ain't going to turn that heat down. It's so stinking hot, I can't even concentrate. I was 71.5, sorry. It rose almost a full degree. It felt great. Thank you. It's my mother-in-law saying that. felt great. She's a good judge of that. But even if she didn't like it in here, did you know we got a lot to be thankful for? I, here's what amazes me. People always think they have a valid reason to complain. But what they don't recognize is it's apathy manifested. That's all complaining is. The manifestation of apathy. That's why I said you complain. If you're focused on God and you're focused on everything He's done, what do you have to complain about? You can stay up to date with everything happening at Accelerate Church by downloading our app. Add events directly to your calendar, receive notifications when services are going live, hear previous sermons preached by Pastor Jeremy, and you can even give right there from your mobile device. The Accelerate Church app has everything you need right there in the palm of your hand. Head over to your app store today and type in Accelerate Church Amarillo to download to your mobile device. People always think they have a valid reason to complain. But what they don't recognize is it's apathy manifested. That's all complaining is. The manifestation of apathy. That's why else would you complain? If you're focused on God and you're focused on everything he's done, what do you have to complain about? I want you to think about that for a minute because complaining, this is a real and present danger for every American that's hearing my voice. People in other countries even could, but especially American Christians. It's like they think they get a badge in heaven because they're professional complainers. There's no reward handed out for the complainer in heaven. Are are you following me? No? You know what that equated to? Apathy. You know what else it equated to? A body scattered in the wilderness. Don't complain to some of them, and they were destroyed by the destroyer. Complaining always connects you to destruction. So stay out of that. That was a little bit of a side journey today, but that was a good side journey. Verse 11. Now all these things happen to them. We could shake our heads or we could just pay attention and say, as examples. Well, examples for who? Well, they're written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. So I don't know who you think you are that you think you're never going to fall, no matter what. Because if you aren't careful, apathy, which is silent in nature, it does have evidence and fruit we can look at, but I'm telling you, it shows up silently. Apathy. Wow. If that shows up, you could fall. I just want you to know, when you allow apathy to grow in your life, 
verse 12 should just echo in your spirit. There's some people that took their last breath and they can't do anything about this. Their apathy. But I, you can do something, you're still breathing. That's why I'm preaching to you. Because you can't allow yourself to slip in to the sin of apathy. The warning here is to us, upon whom the end of the ages have come here. We're at the end, right? You know that, don't you? People say, oh, we've been hearing that for years. Well, we're closer now than we've ever been. I didn't think we'd see 2024, but I tell you, we're closer now than we've ever been. We should be more urgent than we've ever been. We should not be apathetic. I want you to think about this for a moment. I was reading an old Charles Spurgeon sermon. I like him, Charles Finney, but especially Charles Finney. I don't use, read too many Charles Spurgeons, but I came across one where he was talking about apathy. Maybe that's what spurred this going on on the inside of me because I was reading this and he said, it's amazing to me that we will watch the news or read in, back then the newspaper and everyone will talk about something bad that happened to someone. Much less if, much less if someone gave their life to save others, we think, wow, what a, what a great person. I would love to have met, met that person. But we talk about Jesus dying on the cross and most people are saying, yeah, yeah, we've all heard that. Yeah, I mean, we're just not that interested. What is that? Apathy. I tell you, you better be careful because you can slip into that. He even said in there, he said, why is it? It's so easy to fall asleep in sermons on Sunday. I thought, is he living nowadays? That's the danger of me having him turn the heat up here. Maybe I should have kept it four degrees in here so you wouldn't be asleep this morning. The heat's going, people. Oh. But like I said, some of you, this is the only place you get peace. I try not to be too harsh about it. But I tell you, it's something to think about, isn't it? Why is it when it comes time to study the Word of God, to talk about the things of God, <sighs> I mean, you get sleepy quick. And hey, all the apostles dealt with that. Even the inner core, Peter, James, and John. Jesus said, come with me and pray. And what happened? He was praying. He goes back and they're asleep. He said, could you not pray for an hour? He goes and prays. He comes back. There they are, asleep again. And that's how a lot of disciples of Jesus are. Well, that's why, and I've told you this many times, at prayer meetings, I decide to walk. Because I would hear that and shake my head at Peter. Oh, Peter, James, the job, bless their heart. How embarrassing. It's recorded for all of us to read. They fell asleep at the prayer meeting. But then I'll never forget at 2615 Paramount one morning, I decided I'm going to go pray and there were other people there. And I go and kneel down and I kneel down and I fell asleep. They thought I was caught up in the spirit. The music stopped. It was time to go home. And they're like, where's pastor? He's still kneeling down. We better leave him alone. Didn't know I've fallen asleep. Yes, I'm confessing that right in front of you. Because peace will hit you when you press into the presence of God. Amen? Some of you need that peace because it's missing in your life. That's why I say some come to church, that's the only time they're going to find peace. It's the only time they sleep. But not you that are hungry. <laughs> Might as well smile a little bit. Some of y'all look like, well, I don't want to say what it looks like. I already said I'm not moved by what you look like anyway. I want you to think of this. The warning here is to people that live in the end. That's us. And it's about people that were in covenant with God and literally reigned in a place above every other nation. Any nation that tried to oppose them, they threw them out of their land and took their land. And yet, what is it saying about this nation that was in covenant with God? God wasn't pleased with them. Now, I have to say this. Let me adjust what I just said because it was actually the next generation that rose up and devoured all those enemies that opposed them, right? Because they wouldn't do it. Why? Apathetic. Wow. Again, let me bring up verse 7 and show you this. This is what's written about our examples. Now, you can either take this example or not, but I advise you, pay attention. Here's what's written about them. The people sat down to eat. And drink. Then they rose up, not to worship, but to play. Do you know a lot of churches in America have followed that motto right there? This is how we grow a church. If you want more tails in the seats, you got to make sure we eat, drink, and rise up and play. Yeah. There's a Sunday coming in the not-too-distant future. All across America. It won't be a wave of praying. It will be wear your favorite jersey. Excuse me for mocking it. I just do a little bit because that's not what church is for. That's what the NFL's for. They got stadiums you can go down and celebrate. You can go down to the bars, right? Church is not that. Thank you. I'm Pastor Jeremy, and I approve this message. 
This will probably air on TV around Super Bowl weekend. I'm not mad at anybody, but I'm just pointing this out. We're to come out from the world and be separate. We're not to be the same. Well, it's football sin. Certainly it ain't a sin. But my point is, what are we following as a church? See, you come here, this church is not built for your comfort. This church is built to make you a disciple of Jesus. Oh, it's built to reach the lost to say, come on, come on, come on. There's, there's not much time. You better get right with God. You better come out from the world. You better turn around from the sin business and repent. And you better follow Jesus and pursue his presence like we were singing with all of your heart. But if I followed the motto of let's just eat, drink, and rise up and play, we would have more people here. We would. But I wouldn't have you here because you know the draw here? is to people that say, I'm tired of living the average American Christian lifestyle, and I'm ready to press into the things of God. I think it's interesting that the Bible has it recorded where the Master tells us that a man that says, I'm going to take my ease, I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry. God said, that man's a fool. Then he comes and fills Paul, who prayed in the Spirit more than any other Christian right there in Corinth, according to himself. He said, I pray in tongues more than you all. Remember we read that the other night? Pray in tongues more than all of you. Praise the Lord. That's a lot of praying in tongues. He, by the Holy Spirit, says, take heed to this warning. Here's an example to all of you that will live in the end. Don't be like this. Don't have this idea that you can just eat, drink, rise up, and play. What's the point? You're at ease. Just, I'm just at ease. Just Don't take all that, preacher. Why are you trying to make me think i got to do more? Well, because apathy is a real and present danger. I want you to take note of what else happens when you're apathetic the Bible said and we read it there you become idolatrous what's that? you put other things above God, I just referred to it and I talked about Jersey Sunday you put other things above God you know I could be anything anything that takes your devotion and your attention above the one that died on the cross for you, that makes you an idolater and there's several places in the New Testament where it says that you're going to have to watch out for idolatry. One I'm thinking about says flee from idols, and it's talking about being idolatrous, having anything that you uphold, that you adore, that takes up more of your time than God. Tell me we don't live in a country where this is the case. You're going to evaluate what you want to leave. I'm going back to this, the legacy you're going to leave to your children. Hey there, we're jumping in to the end of the broadcast. We hate that time has run out and we believe you have been strengthened in faith by God's word that has gone forth. If you want to hear more of this, visit AccelerateChurch.cc on the Sermons tab. You'll find everything Pastor Jeremy has preached and it could be just what you're looking for. Again, we are so thrilled that you've joined us today. If you're in the Amarillo area, we'd love to invite you to our services. Wednesday at 7 p.m., Sundays at 10 Mm a.m. We would love to see you and meet you.